Jack Ballard was a statue of a man, hardened by loss in the merciless Alaskan winters, etched with lines of age and pain that stood as stark as the naked birch against the snow. He sat on the porch of his cabin in Meadow Lakes, a steaming mug of black coffee cradled between his hands, watching the gray dawn rupture the perpetual twilight. His cabin was the sanctum of his solitude. Each wooden beam, each crack in the log walls, each worn-out floorboard served as a silent testament to the years he had spent sequestered within, nursing old wounds. On a dusty mantelpiece, a framed photograph of a woman with a soft smile and twinkling eyes stared into the room, an echo of laughter long lost. His musings were interrupted by the sound of gravel crunching beneath tires. A battered old truck pulled up to his cabin, the local grocer, Betty, emerging from the rusted driver's side. Got a delivery for you, Jack, she called out, her voice seeping into the crisp morning air. Betty was a hardy woman, her features forged by the same Alaskan wilderness that had shaped him. She delivered groceries to his cabin once a week, a service born out of a mutual understanding of loneliness. Accepting his groceries, he noticed the drawn-out sigh Betty released as her gaze lingered on a family plot near the edge of the graveyard. Her husband, once a vigorous fisherman, now rested there. In a town so small, death did not simply knock on your door, it moved into the room next to yours. Something bothering you, Betty? He asked, his voice as rough as the Alaskan landscape, but carrying a warmth that softened the edges. It's this blasted smuggling, she replied, worry lines creasing her forehead. Odd things going around the graveyard, heard whispers of folks lurking there at night. Harold wouldn't have stood for it. His heart clenched at the despair in Betty's eyes. Her plea was unspoken, but clear. She didn't just want an investigator. She sought a protector, a guardian. He felt an old, familiar spark ignite within him, a spark of purpose, of duty. The echoes of his past, the relentless pursuit of justice, the protection of loved ones, the echoes of a vow he made to his late wife, they all flared within him, as clear and as poignant as ever. You leave it to me, Betty. I'll look into it, he finally said his voice carrying a promise. As she drove off, his gaze once again fell onto the Meadow Lakes graveyard, its monolithic tombstones etched with the names of those he once knew, standing stark against the white canvas of snow. It was a place of peace, of rest, now seemingly tainted with the stain of criminality. The quiet of the Alaskan winter carried an eerie stillness, as if time itself had taken a seat and was patiently waiting. Jack trudged through the snowy labyrinth of Meadow Lakes, the path leading him to the heart of the town, the graveyard. The tombstones jutted out like fossilized teeth, sharp against the backdrop of the white-laden earth, names and dates weathered by the merciless hands of time. He traced the path with a solemnity that bordered on reverence, his breath misting in the frigid air. The graveyard was a silent testament to the life he'd known, the life he had lost, and a life yet to unfold. His investigation began with a meticulous sweep of the graveyard, the frozen ground hard and unyielding beneath his boots. The strange symbols etched on the gravestones puzzled him, each one whispering an alien language into the wind. They were not the work of mere vandals. Their complexity, their seeming significance, hinted at something more. Among the townsfolk, he found a strange, unsettling mix of apathy and fear. Some brushed off his inquiries with vague answers, their eyes skirting around him as though he was a stranger walking among them. Others wore their fear like a cloak, their eyes darting to the graveyard every so often, a cold shiver running down their spine at the mention of the smugglers and grave robbers. The tension in the town was palpable, he noticed hushed whispers at the local bar, shared between sips of whiskey. He noticed the fleeting glances that followed him, marked by fear, suspicion, and something else he couldn't quite put a finger on. It was in a late night conversation with the local bartender, Jed, that he discovered the first tangible clue. The frequency of the graveyard's oddities coincided with the arrival of a few strangers in town. They came under the guise of anthropologists, fascinated by the history of Meadow Lakes and its people. 
But their keen interest in the graveyard had set Jed on edge. Ain't never seen no anthropologist working under moonlight, Jack, Jed muttered, his words drowned in the clink of glasses and the hushed conversations of the bar. The revelation led him back to the graveyard under the cold gaze of the moon. He could feel the air thick with an otherworldly chill, the snow crunching beneath his boots seeming to echo into the void of the night. A sudden noise drew his attention, a low murmur, whispers dancing on the wind, seeming to originate from the heart of the graveyard. As he approached the sound, he noticed the symbols on the gravestones glowing with a faint ethereal light, the whispers growing louder, almost frenzied. And then, as suddenly as it had begun, it stopped. The graveyard plunged back into silence, the ethereal glow fading away as though it had never been. He stood there, in the biting cold of the night, his heart pounding in his chest. He was no stranger to danger, to the horrors that men were capable of. But this, this was different. Jack Ballard, the selfless protector, the open-minded investigator was staring at the edge of an abyss, teetering on the cusp of an unimaginable reality. And as he looked back at Meadow Lakes, the sleeping houses illuminated under the ghostly moonlight, he knew one thing. He had only just scratched the surface of the ice. His days and nights became a tapestry of investigation, woven with threads of uncomfortable discoveries and unsettling revelations. The patterns of the mysterious symbols began to take shape in his mind, their cryptic language whispering ancient tales. Each visit to the graveyard was punctuated by a growing sense of unease, a feeling of creeping dread that seemed to emanate from the cold, unyielding earth beneath. His search led him to the strange artifacts being smuggled through the town, each piece a relic of a time long past, etched with the same cryptic symbols as those that adorn the tombstones. He handled them with an odd sense of reverence, their cold surfaces seeming to hum with an energy he could not comprehend. Yet the world of Meadow Lakes was not the only one beginning to fray at the edges. His dreams became a battleground of his deepest fears and a cosmic terror that danced at the periphery of his understanding. His late wife, her once warm smile now twisted into a silent scream, reached out to him from an abyss of shifting shadows her form twisted and distorted, wrapped in tendrils of darkness that echoed the cryptic symbols in a terrifying symphony of despair. The locals, too, showed signs of the creeping darkness that had ensnared their town. Their faces, once full of hearty cheer and good-natured humor, now wore expressions of subtle fear and paranoia. Their eyes no longer met his and their conversations would fall silent as he passed. The frost that descended upon Meadow Lakes was not just of the physical kind. An emotional chill had seeped into the hearts of its people. Through the shroud of unease, however, his resolve did not falter. His encounters with the locals, their wary glances, their whispers, and their fear only steeled his resolve. His protective instinct, kindled by Betty's plea, now roared into a blazing fire that pushed back against the encroaching shadows. It was the town's eldest, a native Alaskan woman named Nana, who gave voice to the terror that lurked in the heart of Meadow Lakes. She spoke of a cosmic entity, an ancient evil that slumbered beneath their land, waiting for the stars to align and set it free. Her tales were spun with threads of chilling folklore and cosmic dread, a tapestry that mirrored his nightmarish dreams. You are standing on the edge of a chasm, Jack Ballard, Nana told him her voice a low murmur against the howling Alaskan wind, a chasm that plunges into the depths of time and space, into the heart of a cosmic horror that is beyond our understanding. He left Nana's dwelling with a heavy heart. The town was no longer the haven he had sought from his past traumas. It had become the stage for a chilling play of cosmic horror that was beginning to unravel. As he looked at the graveyard, the tombstones bathed in the cold glow of the setting sun, he knew that the shadows of the past were closing in, mingling with the new terrors that awaited him. Meadow Lakes was not a town known for its unrest. However, the once tranquil community had begun to vibrate with an undercurrent of fear, each heartbeat echoing the cosmic horror that loomed. As Jack journeyed deeper into the mystery, 
He could feel the familiar touch of trauma clawing at the edges of his psyche. Yet he trudged on, fueled by his instinct to protect, to shield Meadow Lakes from the impending terror. Days melted into nights, the sun and moon swapping places in an unending dance, oblivious to the drama unfolding beneath them. The symbols he had been studying started to form a horrifying pattern, each connecting to form a constellation he recognized, the same one that dominated the skies above the town. It was as if the cosmos itself was a player in this grand narrative of horror, weaving its celestial influence into the very fabric of their lives. His heart was laden with a strange mixture of dread and resolve as he shared his findings with Nana. Her face, weathered with the wisdom of ages, took on a somber expression as he explained the alignment of the symbols with the constellation. The stars are aligning, Jack, she whispered, her voice as chilling as the wind that rattled the windows of her cabin. The cosmic entity is stirring from its slumber. The revelation weighed heavy on his mind. The realization that he was standing in the epicenter of a battle that spanned cosmic eons was staggering. It felt like standing at the shore of a vast alien ocean, its depths holding terrors unfathomable. Yet the essence of who he was, the protector, the defender of loved ones, shone through the cosmic dread. With a grim determination etched into his features, he ventured back to the heart of Meadow Lakes, the graveyard. The moon, a spectral eye in the sky, bathed the tombstones in an eerie glow, their shadows dancing like ghosts on the snow-clad ground. A strange music filled the air, the cries of the cosmos intermingled with a low hum that seemed to radiate from the very earth beneath him. The graveyard was alive with an otherworldly energy, the ground beneath his feet vibrating with a subtle yet undeniable force. As he moved deeper into the graveyard, the whispers grew louder, more insistent. They echoed around him in a symphony of celestial harmonies, singing tales of ancient horrors and cosmic entities. And then his eyes fell on the central gravestone, the one adorned with the most intricate symbols. It pulsed with the same ethereal light he had seen before, but this time it did not fade away. The light illuminated a hidden compartment in the stone, within which lay an ancient artifact. It was made of a material he could not identify, inscribed with the same cryptic symbols. As he carefully removed it, he felt a rush of energy, the whispers crescendoing in a euphoric chorus. It was as though he held a piece of the cosmos itself in his hands. The connection was undeniable. The artifact, the constellation, the cosmic entity that slumbered beneath the town. They were all parts of a complex cosmic puzzle, and he found himself at the center, holding a key piece. As he walked away from the graveyard, artifact in hand, he knew he was stepping further into the shadows. But within those shadows, he found an unexpected resilience, an unwavering resolve. The universe might have been screaming in cosmic horror, but he was ready to face it, to protect his town and the people within it from the darkness that threatened to consume them all. As the cosmic alignment drew closer, Meadow Lakes teetered on the precipice of the unknown. The air hummed with energy, the stars burned brighter in the inky sky, and the townsfolk moved as though in a trance, ensnared by an unseen force. The man whose past was etched with loss and sorrow stood at the heart of it all. He held the ancient artifact, pulsing with the energy of distant stars and eons past, its form a testament to an alien power that stretched the bounds of human comprehension. He shared his findings with Nana, her eyes reflecting the cosmic dread that hung in the air like a chilling mist. She recounted an ancient ritual, a way to appease the cosmic entity that threatened their very existence. The artifact was the centerpiece, a key to the abyss that held the entity in its slumber. As the constellation aligned above them, the town gathered in the graveyard, their faces illuminated by the spectral glow of the celestial bodies. Jack, with Nana at his side, began the ritual. The artifact hummed in his grasp, the symbols etched into its surface glowing with an ethereal light, echoing the starry tapestry above them. The cosmos seemed to hold its breath as he invoked the alien words, each syllable a pulse of energy that reverberated through the space around him. 
The people of Meadow Lake stood in silent awe, their eyes fixed on the man who had become their protector, their guardian against the abyss. Then a voice filled the air, resonating from the artifact and into the very marrow of their bones. It was an echo from the cosmos, an ancient entity communicating in a language that danced on the precipice of comprehension. The ground shook, a sigh from the abyss as the entity stirred. He felt a rush of emotions, fear, awe, determination. His past pain, the loss he'd borne, had led him to this, to standing between an ancient cosmic entity and the people he'd come to call his own. He was their shield, their defender against the abyss. With the final invocation, a surge of energy erupted from the artifact. It shot towards the sky, meeting the glowing constellation. And for a moment, the entire town was bathed in a blinding light. And then silence. The ground stilled, the air became calm, and the artifact ceased its humming. The celestial glow faded, leaving the graveyard bathed in the soft silver light of the moon. The cosmic entity, stirred from its slumber, had returned to the abyss. He stood, the artifact now silent in his hands. He could feel the weight of the town's gazes on him, their silent gratitude filling the frosty air. He had faced the abyss, the trauma of his past intertwining with the cosmic horror of his present, and emerged victorious. As the townsfolk began to disperse, a sense of normalcy returning to their steps, he found himself standing alone in the graveyard. The past, with its wounds and losses, seemed a distant memory, his trauma no longer a chain but a source of strength. In the quiet of Meadow Lakes, under the cosmic tapestry of the night sky, Jack Ballard, the man who had journeyed from loss to protector, knew one thing. He had found his purpose in the heart of cosmic horror. The man who had once sought solitude now stood as a beacon against the abyss, his heart intertwined with the fate of a town he'd come to call home. In the somber murmur of pre-dawn, Ketchikan rested between the silhouettes of wilderness and the edge of civilization. The rugged town, awash in the muted hues of the Alaskan landscape, was a spectral tableau, shrouded in the enigma of the vanishing light as the midnight sun retreated and the northern lights staged their eerie waltz across the firmament. A solitary figure shuffled through this haunting panorama, his footsteps a lonely percussion against the silence. Detective Arthur McHugh, a man of hard-won years and even harder-won wisdom, was a stalwart remnant of the past. His eyes, the color of the stormy Alaskan sea, carried a distinct gleam of perseverance and resolve, belying the weariness that lay beneath. His chiseled face, lined with a lifetime of relentless pursuit of truth, bore the weathered testament of relentless toil and an intimate acquaintance with sorrow. His office, a symphony of stacked papers and case files, was dimly lit by the spectral glow of a solitary lamp. He sat in silent contemplation, his gaze drifting over the piles of unsolved cases, his mind grappling with the elusive threads of reality. Among the sea of unsolved mysteries, the files about the recent disappearances seemed to pull him with an uncanny allure. Each person missing had their final moments traced back to the city's aging junkyard a seemingly innocent place turned eerie by the cloak of inexplicable mystery. Something about this place, McHugh mumbled to himself, his fingers tracing the edges of the grainy black and white picture of the junkyard. It bore the silent witness of abandoned memories, decades of discarded fragments, a chaos of the forgotten. And now it appeared the junkyard was discarding the people who dared to tread within its haunted expanse. His thoughts were interrupted by a sudden knock. Officer Maggie Smith, a young recruit with an earnest gaze, entered with a worried expression. Detective McHugh, she started, handing over a new file. Another one vanished, last seen near the junkyard. The room was filled with an uneasy silence, the weight of her words sinking in. McHugh's steely gaze met hers. Another one, huh? He muttered, the ghost of a sigh escaping his lips. Yes, sir, Maggie affirmed, her voice slightly tremulous. What could possibly be happening there? McHugh studied the file intently, his mind running through a gauntlet of possibilities, discarding each one as too mundane, too common, for the uncanny happenings that were unfolding. I don't know, Smith, not yet. 
but I'm hell-bent on finding out, he asserted, his tone carrying a grim determination. The rising dawn cast long shadows across the room, a testament to the mysteries held close in the heart of the silent town. With the new day, a deeper plunge into the enigma was inevitable. As McHugh stood, his gaze hardened, reflecting the ceaseless quest for truth that had defined his existence. He knew he would need all his courage and open-mindedness for the strange journey ahead. The junkyard, he thought, a shiver running down his spine. I must explore its secrets. The world was a cacophony of color and light as Detective Arthur McHugh drove through the heart of Ketchikan. The town was teeming with life, yet beneath the seeming normalcy, a haunting undercurrent pulsed. His destination, the junkyard, was a monstrous graveyard of the discarded, the ruined, the forgotten. It sprawled on the outskirts of town, a testament to the ceaseless cycle of human consumption and neglect. Arriving, he parked his battered vehicle next to the junkyard's rickety gate, its rusted iron groaning a mournful greeting as he pushed it open. Before him spread an ocean of derelict vehicles, a labyrinthine chaos of rusted metal, broken glass, and ancient machinery. An odd stillness hung in the air, a silence that murmured with whispered secrets and silent screams. A gnarled figure shuffled towards him, face carved by a lifetime of harsh winters and ruthless summers. This was Peter, the junkyard's keeper, an Inuit of indeterminable age. His eyes, deep set and strangely luminescent, held a certain guarded wariness. Detective McHugh, he rasped, his voice gravel against the quiet. You seek answers where there may be none. McHugh's eyes hardened. I seek the truth, Peter, no matter how elusive, he replied, his determination seeping into his words. Tell me, have you seen anything odd happening around here? The old Inuit paused, a shiver of something undefinable passing over his weathered face. This place, detective, it is older than it seems, touched by what lives beyond the veil. Beyond the veil? McHugh echoed, a chill coursing out through his veins. Devours from beyond. Peter whispered cryptically, his gaze drifting towards the junkyard. His words hung in the air, infusing the scene with a strange dread that seemed almost tangible. Left with Peter's cryptic words, McHugh ventured deeper into the junkyard. A singular oddity caught his attention, a battered teddy bear, its glassy eyes staring blankly into the void. This belonged to one of the missing people. His heart clenched. He was on the right track. As he moved further, he began noticing peculiar symbols etched onto rusted car doors woven into the ground with discarded wires. They were uncanny and alien, their presence an anomaly within the realm of the ordinary. As the sun dipped below the horizon, the junkyard transformed. The husks of rusted cars cast monstrous shadows that danced eerily in the waning light. An unease settled within him, an echo of something far more ancient and terrifying than he could comprehend. Peter's words rang in his mind, a chilling refrain to the unfolding mystery. Dusk had draped itself over Ketchikan when he finally left the junkyard. He could feel the weight of countless untold stories bearing down on him, the specter of the unknown gnawing at his resolve. As he drove back, the image of the bizarre symbols and Peter's warning etched itself into his mind. I need to return, he murmured to the night, his voice swallowed by the icy winds. I need to know what happens when the world sleeps. Ketchikan slumbered beneath the blanket of night, a spectral echo of its daylight self, as Detective Arthur McHugh returned to the forsaken junkyard. The memories of past losses swirled within him like a chilling eddy, shaping his resolve, fortifying his courage. His siblings had been lost to the unknown, and he'd be damned if he allowed the missing persons to share the same fate. The old junkyard lay in wait, an arena of forgotten shadows. As he traversed the labyrinth of wrecked automotives, he felt as though the rusted giants watched him with the cold, glassy eyes of discarded headlights. The sharp scent of decaying metal and old rubber lingered heavily in the air, a grim incense for the ceremony of the night. Wrapped in the heavy cloak of darkness, he made himself a makeshift camp in the heart of the junkyard. The silence was deafening, 
punctuated only by the quiet hum of nocturnal insects and the sporadic rustling of a lone night breeze. And then, as midnight approached, a peculiar tremor ran through the ground. A chorus of discordant groans rippled through the junkyard, as if the rusted relics were awakening from a deep slumber. A sharp chill ran down his spine, a primal instinct whispering warnings his conscious mind struggled to comprehend. Peter's words echoed in his mind, devourers from beyond. He tensed, every instinct screaming at him to flee. Yet he was bound to the truth, anchored by the weight of his responsibility. Slowly, the ground at the heart of the junkyard began to undulate as if breathing. An ethereal light spilled from the cracks, coalescing into a pulsating portal of mesmerizing terror. It shimmered with an otherworldly glow, a tear in the fabric of reality that bled an eldritch radiance into the world. Then they emerged, shapes unfathomable, silhouettes that twisted and writhed against the laws of nature and geometry. They were of darkness and void, and their very presence seemed to drain the light around them. He felt a crushing dread clawing at his sanity, the incomprehensible terror standing before him a grotesque mockery of all he knew to be true. He watched in abject horror as the entities began to explore the junkyard, their movements a haunting dance that toyed with the boundaries of space and time. He felt himself an intruder, a witness to a forbidden spectacle that mocked the very notions of existence and reality. He retreated, struggling to maintain his sanity amidst the terror. He clutched the earth beneath him, the cold, hard reality, serving as his last tether to the world he knew. His mind was a whirlwind of denial and acceptance, a storm that threatened to consume him. As dawn approached, the entities receded, folding back into the blinding portal until only the memory of their horrific forms remained. The portal contracted, leaving the junkyard as it was, save for the solitary detective grappling with the aftermath of his encounter. Arthur rose, his body heavy, his mind heavier. He was standing on the brink of an abyss, staring into the depths of an unknown that threatened to swallow him whole. Yet he felt an odd calm. He had seen the other side, and it had seen him. Dawn, he whispered to himself, his voice a shattered echo in the sprawling field of discarded debris. Dawn is my reprieve, my solace. But as the sunlight streamed into the junkyard, he realized a daunting truth. Dawn was merely a pause, a temporary sanctuary from the cosmic horrors that lurked in the night. And night, as it were, would always return. As he left the junkyard, he carried the chilling knowledge that his understanding of the world and his place within it had been irrevocably fractured. His journey was far from over. He had merely taken the first steps into a much larger and far more terrifying universe. The pristine serenity of the Alaskan daylight held no solace for Detective Arthur McHugh. His encounter with the unearthly beings had left him in a state of uneasy restlessness. He now walked a world that harbored a chilling secret within its bosom, a reality within a reality, an other side seething beneath the ordinary. Back in his office, he pondered over the cryptic symbols he had seen at the junkyard. His thoughts meandered to the old myths of Ketchikan, the tales Peter would often whisper about ancient beings from forgotten realms. The old Inuit's words took on a horrific new significance in light of his encounter. Officer Maggie Smith, the earnest young officer who had been assisting him, came to his office bearing new files and fresh cups of coffee. Her eyes widened as she took in his haggard appearance, the shadow of the unspeakable terror that still clung to him. Sir, she began, her voice shaky, you look like you've seen a ghost. Something far worse, Smith, he replied, his gaze unfocused, his voice a hollow echo. As he described his experience in hushed, tremulous tones, Officer Smith's face paled. Yet the fear in her eyes was countered by a flicker of determination. She shared his pursuit of truth, his relentless need to protect their town, even if it meant courting unspeakable horrors. Together, they poured over the files, attempting to piece together a puzzle that seemed to warp and distort with each new revelation. They sought patterns, clues within the disappearances that could shed light on the entities and their haunting attraction to the junkyard. Days morphed into nights and back into days, 
a cyclical dance that held a foreboding echo of the portal's pulsating rhythm. Arthur's nightmares were now painted with scenes of the other side, the cryptic symbols seared into his dreams like a brand. Arthur and Maggie became pilgrims of the arcane, their journeys taking them deep into the mysteries of Ketchikan. They consulted scholars and historians, chased down every lead, and even delved into esoteric occult texts. They uncovered a pattern. The symbols belonged to an ancient language, a form of communication between realms, a beacon for the cosmic entities. As the Alaskan sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky with hues of twilight, he stood before the junkyard once again. This time, however, he was not alone. Maggie stood beside him, her determination unwavering, her resolve mirroring his own. Together, they faced the night, armed with a newfound understanding, standing firm on the precipice of their sanity. The truth they sought was terrifying, yet they were undeterred. Arthur felt the old scars of his past losses throb, a silent reminder of his mission's personal stakes. The chasm of the mind, he murmured, his gaze lost in the foreboding expanse of the junkyard, is where the real battle lies. The quiet of the Alaskan night was pierced by the dissonant harmony of the waking junkyard. Detective Arthur McHugh and Officer Maggie Smith watched as the spectral light once again spilled from the yawning chasm, filling the air with an ethereal, menacing glow. It was time. Standing on the edge of the portal, Arthur felt the old wounds of loss reopen, the phantoms of his siblings whispering amidst the cosmic winds. His gaze was mirrored by Maggie, her own resolve etched into the firm set of her jaw, the fire in her eyes. The truth, he murmured to the unfathomable void before him, I offer myself to find it. And with those words, he stepped into the glowing chasm, Maggie following close behind. The world around them warped and twisted, reality itself seeming to scream in protest as they were swallowed by the unearthly radiance. The other side was a realm of chaos, a maddening panorama of alien landscapes and impossible geometries. Cosmic entities drifted around them, their terrifying forms an echo of the nightmarish visions that had plagued his dreams. Yet within this insanity, amidst the mind-shattering horror, he felt a strange clarity. His mind, stretched to its limits, teetered on the brink of understanding. The symbols, the disappearances, the entities, they were all connected, cogs in a horrifying machine that spanned across dimensions. Armed with his newfound understanding, he began to speak, his voice imbued with the cadences of the ancient language they had discovered, resonated through the other side. The entities paused, their formless faces turning toward him, their attention fixed. He spoke of boundaries and respect, of the sanctity of their separate worlds. He spoke of the lost souls, the unwitting victims of their cosmic dance. And finally, he spoke of a pact, an agreement of non-interference, a plea for peaceful coexistence. The entities listened, their eldritch forms shimmering with each word. The silence that followed was oppressive, a pause that seemed to hang in the balance between annihilation and salvation. And then slowly, the entities began to retreat, their monstrous forms melding into the fabric of the other side. A sense of understanding, a silent acceptance of his plea hung in the air as the portal began to close. They were unceremoniously expelled back into their world, the silent junkyard greeting their return. As dawn's first light broke over the horizon, the horror of the night seemed nothing more than a dreadful memory, yet the scars it had left on their souls were indelible, a permanent reminder of the truth they had sought and found. Exhausted but resolute, Arthur and Maggie looked upon the junkyard, their junkyard. They had stared into the abyss and returned, forever changed, marked by the cosmic dance of horror and reality. Their journey had cost them their innocence, their peace, but they had safeguarded their town, their world. They were custodians of a terrifying secret, a truth too heavy for the world to bear. As he took one last look at the junkyard, he felt a sudden sharp pain course through him. He collapsed, his strength leaving him. 
The toll of crossing realities, of bridging the abyss, was finally catching up. As his vision blurred, the faces of his siblings appeared before him, ethereal and comforting. He felt a sense of peace envelop him, a soothing balm to the chaos he had endured. Truth, he murmured, his voice barely a whisper as he drew his last breath. A beacon in the darkness. His eyes closed, his body stilled. Maggie kneeled beside him, her eyes brimming with tears yet filled with a quiet resolve. The baton had been passed. She would carry the truth, guard their reality, until her own last stand. In a labyrinth of worn-out memories, stashed in a forgotten corner of Lower Manhattan, Amos Redwood resided. A veil of solitude wrapped his austere, third-floor apartment, its somber mood pierced only by the furtive dance of lamplight over stacks of newspapers, the parchment warriors of truth he'd sired over the decades. His life, a chiseled tribute to ink, paper, and the relentless pursuit of honesty, was a monument to both his virtues and his vices. His gaze, an opalescent gleam forged from countless sunsets in the merciless grit of time, strayed over his collection. There, in the faded headlines, the echoes of his younger self whispered tales of a world on the brink. It was a world that demanded he be generous with his time, persistent with his questions, and brave in the face of harsh realities, a world that had been a crucible for his spirit. Yet his eyes still held an incandescent spark, the ember of a fire stoked by the biting cold winds of his childhood. Shadows from an impoverished past loomed in the deeper recesses of his apartment, their forms etched in the threadbare rug beneath his worn-out loafers, in the peeling wallpaper that bore silent witness to the years gone by, in the kitchen that knew too many nights of canned soup and stale bread. It was a bitter winter evening when the envelope arrived, anonymous and terse, with a note that read, Look into Reverend Blackburn in Sterling, Alaska. His instincts, honed by years of navigating treacherous waters of political subterfuge and organized crime, tingled with a rare sense of foreboding. A religious leader, shrouded in mystery, held sway over a far-flung town. What could be the hook? Uncovering the seedier side of life had never been a chore for him. It was a challenge, an opportunity to expose the truth that simmered beneath the surface of appearances. But this, this was different. The unassuming message sparked a glimmer of purpose in his weary heart. It promised more than a story. It hinted at an elusive truth that lurked in the shadows, a key to unlocking a mystery far greater than the sum of its parts. With the glint of a seasoned hunter in his eyes, he made his decision, packing his belongings and stepping out into the frigid New York night, a lone figure swallowed by the city's pulse. His destination, Sterling, Alaska, a place of biting cold and the tantalizing promise of a story unlike any he'd pursued before. Amos journeyed to Sterling, Alaska, a pilgrimage from the mundane into the mystic, propelled by the silent whispers of his unyielding instinct. He stepped off the plane into the virgin snowfall, an ancient scribe venturing into a realm where faith and mystery wove a curious tapestry against the backdrop of frost and solitude. The quaint town, huddled against the relentless Alaskan wilderness, hid its secrets well beneath a blanket of tranquility. Sterling, in all its frosted, placid beauty, held a melancholic silence, a strange mix of pastoral calm and an enigmatic hush. The quaint hamlets and winding trails were just a stage. The true play unfolded in the gazes of the townsfolk. Their eyes, quiet as the whispering pines, held a myriad of untold tales, all centered around the charismatic figure of Reverend Blackburn. It was at the heart of the town, beneath a constellation of neon lights, that the Lambs of Night nightclub resided. Its facades were nondescript, merging seamlessly with the rustic town aesthetic. Yet its mystique was palpable. From behind its curtain windows and shuttered doors, muffled laughter and hushed whispers, a rhythm of hypnotic music emanated, a siren song for the curious and the lost. Determined to fathom the mystery that cloaked the Reverend, Amos became a familiar figure in the shadowy corners of the nightclub. He watched, listened, and observed. He wove through the crowds, catching snippets of hushed reverence, 
for the religious leader and the inexplicable aura of adoration that he commanded. Through the winding labyrinth of conversations and confessions, the sharp edges of his journalist instincts carved out a pattern. Reverend Blackburn was not merely a shepherd for his flock. He was their beacon, their rock, their deliverer. His sermon wasn't simply faith. It was an intoxicating blend of euphoria and absolution that left his congregation in awe and obsession. One evening, the whispers in the wind brought him something he'd been hunting, abyss gaze. It was mentioned in hushed reverence, a phrase that rippled through the club's murmuring patrons, often followed by vacant smiles and far-off gazes. It wasn't just a drug, it was a sacrament, a part of the evening's ritualistic festivities that swayed with a rhythm older than the town itself. Driven by an insatiable thirst for the truth, Amos devised a plan. He'd get his hands on the abyss gaze and unravel its secrets. It was a dangerous game, yet he was fueled by the open-mindedness that had seen him through the underbelly of the world's darkest secrets. His opportunity came in the form of a young waitress, Emily, whose eyes held an innocent curiosity and a tangible fear of the enigmatic reverend. Seeing a chance to uncover the truth, he struck up a conversation using the comforting guise of a sympathetic ear. In their whispered exchanges, punctuated by lingering silences, Emily revealed she could procure a sample of abyss gaze. The vial sat in Amos's trembling hands, a harbinger of chaos in a small, liquid-filled ampule. A mind enhancer that promised communion with the beyond was an elusive yet potent piece in this strange puzzle. With Emily's help, he managed to send a sample for analysis, while the rest of Sterling continued its languid dance with the dark. Days turned into nights, a cyclical waltz that pulsed with an undercurrent of tension. The nightclub throbbed with the feverish energy of its patrons. The rituals grew more intense, and the adoration for the reverend began to border on fanatical devotion. In this orchestrated chaos, Amos found himself in a paradox of time. He delved into stories of the townsfolk, uncovering layers of their devotion as if peeling an otherworldly fruit. From the oldest patron, Mildred, he learned of the Reverend's miraculous arrival during their harshest winter, promising salvation. From the burly lumberjack, Jonah, he heard of the euphoria it brought, a bliss that rendered their mundane struggles insignificant. The findings about Abyss Gaze arrived in a sterile envelope, promising to shatter the quaint simplicity of Sterling. The drug didn't merely enhance the mind, it was a conduit a catalyst to open doors into unknown cosmic realities. It hinted at communication with something beyond their comprehension, a being referred to in hushed whispers as the Dark Shepherd. This revelation rattled the bedrock of Amos's understanding. He was not merely waiting in a local mystery, but had plunged into a cosmic conspiracy. Yet instead of retreating, he felt an eerie pull, a curiosity that tugged at the cornerstones of his sanity. He began to see Sterling in a different light, a pulsating organ in the cosmic entity's body. The town was under the Dark Shepherd's influence, being molded by its subtle, omnipresent touch. From the eerie silence that blanketed the town to the fervor that danced in the nightclub, everything was an orchestrated symphony conducted by Reverend Blackburn. Amos's pursuit of truth evolved into a personal obsession. He felt an inexplicable draw towards the Dark Shepherd, a horrifying yet intriguing entity that held the town in its abysmal grasp. His nights were filled with vivid nightmares of otherworldly landscapes, where formless horrors danced amidst impossible geometries, each dream a testament to the cosmic horror that was slowly permeating his reality. A hush descended over Sterling, a foreboding calm before the storm. Amos, drawn by the pulsating rhythm of the cosmic nightmare that had wrapped its tendrils around the town, found himself standing outside the Lambs of Night nightclub. A sense of fateful dread, interwoven with an intoxicating curiosity, tingled in his veins. The decision to use the abyss gaze was not taken lightly. It was a desperate, reckless move, a plunge into the gaping maw of the cosmic beast. Yet the need to know, to unravel the horrifying truth gnawed at his spirit, an itch that could only be scratched by staring into the abyss itself. Guided by Emily, 
He consumed the elixir in the pulsating heart of the club amidst chanting and ecstatic dancing. As the crowd swayed in fervor around him, the world warped, twisted, and shattered. Reality came apart at the seams, surrendering to the ethereal landscape that abyss gaze revealed. Formless shapes wove in and out of existence, twisting into geometries that no sane mind could comprehend. A realm beyond the stars, the cosmos, and reality unfurled before Amos, his psyche floundering on the shores of this alien world. Within this tumultuous chaos, he sensed a presence, an entity that throbbed with an insidious, dark allure, the Dark Shepherd, a monolithic shadow, formless and ever-changing, a horror beyond comprehension. It pulsed with a maddening rhythm, its silent whispers echoing through the realms, promising knowledge and purpose. Confronted with the mind-shattering reality, Amos was a mariner lost in an ocean of cosmic dread. Yet amidst the fear, a fragment of his journalistic spirit clung to sanity, documenting the encounter with the cosmic deity. He noted its influence over Sterling, its symbiotic connection with the abyss gaze, and the terrifying epiphany that Reverend Blackburn was not its servant, but its herald. As Amos drifted back to reality, he was a changed man. His eyes, once filled with the spark of curiosity and the flame of truth, now reflected the inky abyss of cosmic horror he'd gazed into. Reverend Blackburn's role in this orchestration of horror was evident, but the town's fate remained a daunting enigma. Haunted by the nightmarish communion with the Dark Shepherd, Amos found himself standing at a crossroads. His life had been a testament to exposing the truth, but what he now knew was a truth too monstrous to reveal, too horrific for the world to comprehend. In the solitude of his room, he wrestled with his conscience, the knowledge gnawing at his sanity like a relentless beast. The voices of the cosmos whispered in his ears, a chorus that promised understanding and purpose in the surrender to the Dark Shepherd. His gaze strayed to the vial of abyss gaze, the remnants of the elixir shimmering with the spectral hues of the cosmic abyss. The days rolled on in a timeless haze, his obsession with the Dark Shepherd growing. He frequented the Lambs of Night nightclub, each visit a step further into the embrace of the entity. Reverend Blackburn, once the object of his investigation, now stood as a guiding figure, an emissary of the otherworldly deity. In hushed conversations veiled beneath the euphoric cacophony of the nightclub, the Reverend shared tales of the Dark Shepherd, its origin lost in the realms of time and space, its power, a pulsating rhythm of cosmic might that bound them all in a harmonious dance of submission and enlightenment. In a moment of terrifying clarity, Amos realized his purpose. He was not merely an observer, a journalist documenting the town's strange narrative. He was a participant, a vessel for the cosmic entity's will. The power of the Dark Shepherd had selected him as its chronicler, a scribe to document the rise of a new order. His articles, once a beacon of truth, became a testament to the Dark Shepherd. The cosmic horror that had once threatened to consume him now fueled his words, filling his narratives with cryptic hints of the deity's influence over Sterling. Beneath the starlit quilt of the Alaskan night, the town of Palmer lay ensconced in a cocoon of ordinariness. Each dwelling, each quiet street, and even the austere wooden silhouette of the local homeless shelter wore an unpretentious mask of quietude. The stark Alaskan wilderness, with its harsh beauty, served as a rough-hewn frame to this serene tableau. In one such humble abode, nestled in the shadows of towering spruces, resided our solitary protagonist, Edwin. A soft light bled through the gaps in his thick, moth-eaten curtains, casting long, trembling shadows on the thick blanket of snow outside. He sat hunched over a desk, a cup of lukewarm coffee forgotten beside him, his visage softly illuminated by the sepia glow of a single desk lamp. A retired private investigator, Edwin was a man of aged lines and furrowed brows, his silver-streaked hair hinting at a chronicle of past experiences. His eyes were clear, intense, but carried within them a profound weariness, 
a testament to the battles fought with an anxiety disorder that had long prowled his life like a shadowed beast. Yet beneath the shroud of personal torment lay an unassuming kindness. Edwin was a man who found solace in service. It was this pursuit that often led him to the town's homeless shelter, a rustic structure of aged wood and time-worn brick, carrying stories of forgotten lives within its walls. In the shelter's overcrowded common area, he listened. I saw it, Ed, old Tom, a stalwart shelter resident, insisted one afternoon, his voice a rusty whisper, trembling with fervor. Felt like it knew me, knew my thoughts. His audience, a motley congregation of the dispossessed, nodded along, their faces etched with an odd blend of fear, intrigue, and resignation. A murmur of agreement echoed in the room, a collective memory of spectral visitations, shared encounters with the inexplicable, now rising to the surface. Yet this was not the realm of sensationalism. It was a world of shared vulnerability and fragmented lives. Edwin listened, his eyes reflecting deep empathy as he sifted through the layers of their shared experiences. His quiet nods, the warm touch on a cold, shaking hand, his sincere murmur of assurance served as a balm, a beacon of light in the foggy landscape of the unexplained. As Edwin walked home that night, under the seemingly infinite expanse of the Alaskan sky, he glanced back at the silhouette of the shelter, a bastion of humanity amidst the cosmic indifference. In the depths of his heart, a fire was kindled, a commitment to unravel the enigma, to make Palmer a safer haven for its vulnerable inhabitants. The dawn of a new day found Edwin retracing his steps to the shelter, an unflinching determination simmering beneath his mild demeanor. As he tread the frost-kissed streets, the spectral whispers from the day prior swirled around him, wrapping the town of Palmer in an unseen chilling cloak. The shelter stood, stoic against the morn's hazy light, as if concealing the intangible phenomena that nested within. He entered, drawn by the pull of unsolved mysteries and a promise to make sense of the unseen for those who had seen too much already. His days became a waltz of inquiry, an intricate dance of questions and answers. When did you see them? He'd ask, his voice a gentle breeze against the raw candor of their tales. What did they do? How did they make you feel? His queries, though simple, revealed a labyrinth of experiences that began to thread together into a tapestry of uncanny occurrences. He spoke with Lydia, whose spectral visitor had whispered of lost love and forgotten heartaches. He lent his ear to Sam, who saw shadows dance in impossible patterns. Each story, each witness, added a new hue to the spectral mystery. Beneath the weight of this uncanny chronicle, the walls of the shelter seemed to sigh, as if in acknowledgement of its unseen inhabitants. All the while, Edwin was a constant, the human touch in the heart of the extraordinary. His empathy was a glow that warmed the chill off their tails. He offered comfort in his quiet way, a nod here, a warm pat there, a soft word of understanding, becoming their anchor in this unmoored sea of strange happenings. Yet, as he delved deeper, a peculiar pattern began to unfurl, a sinuous thread of spectral familiarity. Each encounter, each unsettling visitation seemed rooted in the history of the shelter and its transient denizens. A chilling realization washed over him. These were not just random apparitions. These phantoms bore an intimate connection with the shelter and its residents, an ethereal echo of the forgotten past replaying in the dreary present. Edwin spent his evenings in the town's quaint library, buried in stacks of archived newspapers and local history. The scent of decaying paper and fading ink became his companions as he unraveled the rich, forgotten past of the shelter. Its previous occupants, tales of love, loss, and tragedy echoing from the brittle pages. He stumbled upon a somber piece of history, a fire many decades ago which had claimed lives creating an indelible scar on the town's memory. The date lined up suspiciously well with the beginnings of the ghostly visitations. By the time he departed the library, the moon had claimed the sky, casting long spectral shadows across Palmer. The uncanny seemed to have found a home in the town, and Edwin, with his newfound insights, had just invited it in. His role as a mere investigator had shifted, 
He was now part of the tapestry, his actions now threads in the spectral story. With the veil of spectral understanding draped over his shoulders, Edwin returned to the shelter. The atmosphere had shifted. The air seemed denser, heavier, as though it bore the weight of unseen stories, spectral narratives suspended in time and space. The shelter's occupants greeted him with a mix of relief and resignation. His presence had become a constant amid the ever-churning tide of uncanny happenings. He found himself sharing in their spectral experiences, his waking reality beginning to blur at the edges, the otherworldly bleeding into the mundane. One evening, as the twilight painted the Alaskan sky in a palette of violets and pinks, Edwin experienced his first apparition. The world around him seemed to ripple, distort, as if seen through a water-stained glass. A figure materialized, hazy and indistinct, yet oddly familiar. It hovered at the periphery of his vision, a mere silhouette that sent cold tendrils of dread slithering down his spine. Their conversations, if they could be called that, were nonverbal exchanges. Ideas, images, raw emotions transmitted from the apparition invaded his mind. They spoke of hidden realities, of thresholds leading to realms beyond human comprehension. It was a maddening puzzle, a cryptic dance of abstract concepts that left him reeling, yet more determined than ever to decipher their meaning. His once peaceful existence had now become a spectral symphony. Each day brought a new encounter, each conversation with the apparitions a step closer to the brink of the unknown. His anxiety, a familiar beast from the past, prowled alongside these encounters, feeding off the uncertainty. Yet within him, a wellspring of resolve held steady. He would decipher this eerie cipher, not just for himself, but for the vulnerable souls who had come to rely on him. Edwin's investigations took a deeper turn, now focused not merely on who these apparitions were, but what they wanted. Each interaction, each ghostly visitation added to his growing understanding of these unseen thresholds. He began documenting these experiences in a journal of spectral encounters that held tantalizing hints at realities unseen. The whispers of the apparitions grew louder, their messages more urgent, leading him towards a revelation that was as terrifying as it was awe-inspiring. These ghosts of the past were not merely echoes, they were gatekeepers, sentient signposts guiding him towards the otherworldly. One such message emerged from the ether more coherent than others. Doorways await your steps, seeker. Worlds unseen long for your gaze. His heart pounded, a drum echoing the rhythm of his growing terror and intrigue. Portals to other worlds. A concept so surreal it threatened to shatter his understanding of reality. Yet the pieces fit together in a jigsaw of the bizarre and unthinkable. As the last vestiges of his skepticism faded away, Edwin found himself standing at the precipice of an abyss, an unseen chasm leading to alien realms. He was on the verge of a journey that transcended the bounds of human understanding, propelled by the spectral whispers and his enduring desire to safeguard his world. Edwin, now irrevocably tied to the spectral weave of Palmer's shelter, walked a path that echoed with the whispers of forgotten souls and glimpses of alien realities. Each step was a descent into the spiraling abyss of the unknown, a terrifying embrace of the cosmic unknown that lay just beyond the thin veil of perceivable reality. His interactions with the apparitions deepened. As gatekeepers of the unseen, they became guides in his journey, silent specters whose gestures and silent communions pointed him towards the veiled doorways hidden in the shelter shadows. His quiet determination, the flame that had always burned within him, became a beacon, illuminating the spectral route that unfolded before him. One such encounter led him to a forgotten corner of the shelter, a room long abandoned. Its walls were the patina of decay, the air thick with time-forgotten stories. As he stepped in, the atmosphere seemed to shudder, reality itself trembling under his feet. Here in this room, heavy with the past, lay one of the doorways to the unseen. His heart pounded a syncopated rhythm of fear and anticipation as he approached the spectral portal. 
The apparitions hovered, their forms blurring and shifting as if resonating with the portal's otherworldly energy. With a deep breath, he stepped forward, crossing the unseen threshold into the spiraling abyss. The realm he entered was beyond his comprehension, a swirling landscape of shifting realities. Space curved and twisted, colors bled into each other, and time danced to an alien rhythm. It was a place of nightmares and wonder, an abyss that held visions of realms untouched by human cognition. The experience was a paradox, both profoundly terrifying and beguilingly mesmerizing. Within this kaleidoscopic chaos, Edwin found threads of familiarity. Each spectral encounter, each ghostly apparition he had experienced, seemed to have originated from this surreal landscape. They were fragments of this reality, echoes that had somehow seeped into his world. His attempts to communicate with the denizens of this realm were futile at first. Their forms, their language, their very existence were radically alien. Yet as he navigated the abyss, he found himself adapting, his mind bending and reshaping to understand the uncanny communication. His explorations bore a horrifying revelation. The apparitions, the spectral gatekeepers, were echoes of lost souls trapped in this realm, forever severed from their world. Their intent was not to haunt, but to warn, to prevent the inhabitants of the shelter from stumbling into the spiraling abyss. As Edwin recoiled from the harsh truth, he felt the familiar tug of his anxiety, a cruel serpent coiling around his courage. But he pressed on, the promise of a safer world for the shelter's inhabitants fueling his resolve. Back in the shelter, his return was a shockwave through the mundane reality. His gaze, once warm with empathy, now held the chilling glint of cosmic horror. Yet within his eyes, the residents saw the flicker of a plan a strategy to seal the spectral breaches and save their home from becoming a gateway to the spiraling abyss. Edwin's quiet solitude had been replaced by an eerie tranquility, a calm born of the chilling revelations he held close. His heart pounded out a cadence that spoke of urgency and resolve. With a profound understanding of the spectral stakes at hand, he knew the shelter's plight was his to bear. His strategy was simple yet complex grounded in the mundane while reaching for the arcane. It involved leveraging the spectral energy of the apparitions themselves, coaxing them into a spectral shield, a force to repulse the otherworldly from breaching the veil. As outlandish as it seemed, Edwin felt an odd certainty. This plan, whispered into existence by the spectral echoes of the lost souls, was their shared hope. The shelter's residents, drawn in by his relentless dedication, rallied around him. His silent strength had become a beacon for them, the lighthouse guiding them through this storm of cosmic horror. Despite the uncanny nature of the task, they rose to the challenge, bolstered by his calm leadership and the shared desire for a safer world. The process was grueling, a dance with the uncanny that tested their collective resolve. He led the spectral communion, his quiet voice a steady rhythm, beneath the chorus of the shelter's inhabitants. They chanted, prayed, shared stories of loss and hope, their collective emotions interwoven into a tapestry of spectral resonance. Days blended into nights and the veil of normalcy started to shudder, to shimmer. The air thrummed with spectral energy, a symphony of the unseen. The apparitions swirled around them, resonating with their shared intent. And then, with a gasp that echoed through the very bones of the shelter, the unseen threshold shivered, wavered, and began to seal. Each closure was a cause for shared relief and trepidation. A step closer to their goal, and yet another reminder of the strange path they walked. Edwin, at the epicenter of this spectral storm, remained steady, his resolve unwavering in the face of the otherworldly. The final threshold, the doorway in the forgotten room, proved to be the most challenging. Its spectral energy pulsed with an intensity that sent shivers down his spine. With a deep breath, he stepped forward, his eyes holding the spectral abyss one last time before he began the sealing ritual. As the spectral shield coalesced, a jolt of energy surged through him. His body trembled, his vision blurred, 
and for a moment, he was back in the swirling chaos of the otherworldly. He felt the raw terror of the lost souls, their despair, their longing for the world they had left behind. And in that shared moment of horror and empathy, Edwin sealed the final threshold. When he opened his eyes, the world was the same, yet irrevocably changed. The shelter, once a spectral nexus, was now just a shelter again, its atmosphere free of the whispers that once haunted its walls. Edwin, however, was not the same. The quiet, kind investigator had journeyed into the heart of the cosmic horror and returned as the shield between his world and the unseen. His eyes bore the scars of the otherworldly, the profound knowledge of realities unseen. Yet his heart still pulsed with empathy, a testament to his enduring humanity. His anxiety, once a relentless specter, had been tamed, transformed into a quiet companion on his path of continual bravery. As he looked upon the shelter's residents, their eyes reflecting a newfound peace, he felt a sense of fulfillment. He had battled the cosmic unknown and emerged victorious, all for the promise of a safer world. Arthur Donnelly, a solitary figure wrapped in a trench coat, battered by years and countless cases, descended from the mechanical bird's belly onto the icy tarmac of Homer, Alaska. The biting chill of the Arctic winds didn't faze him. He'd become hardened, much like the lines of determination etched into his aging face, against life's raw elements. The town, cast in hues of white and blue, revealed itself as a character, reticent, cold, and veiled in an enigma. Beneath the town's apparent calm, there was a dissonance he could feel, a harmony disrupted. It was echoed in the hushed whispers of townsfolk who walked past him with barely a glance, and in the sudden silence that descended when he walked into the local tavern. Grave robberies, you said? The bartender, a grizzled man with a bushy mustache, asked, his eyes darting away from Arthur. There was fear in his voice in the stiff way he poured the whiskey. Arthur nodded, the weight of his purpose and the echoes from the town's hidden depths settling on his shoulders. I got any word on that? There was a silence drawn out and ponderous. The man exchanged a wary glance with an old woman seated at the corner. She, with the map of life etched deep into her skin, drew her shawl tighter. You best leave this be, stranger, the woman murmured. These parts ain't for the likes of city folk. Arthur was no stranger to ominous warnings. They were old companions. But the dread in her voice was different. A siren's call that sang of fathomless darkness, of a terror that clawed at the edges of understanding. His exploration took him to the heart of the town's disquiet, the sewers. The entrance loomed above him, a gaping maw etched into the earth's cold skin, a silent sentinel beneath the looming, snow-covered mountains. A shudder ran down his spine, not of cold, but of some ancient, primeval fear. His fear of heights, an old foe from the past, stirred within him as he stared down into the inscrutable depths of the sewer. It was as if he was standing at the edge of a towering cliff, peering down into the shadowy abyss. In his heart, he held the only beacon capable of penetrating the darkness of the coming storm, the fragile spark of optimism and the hunger to mend the broken ties with his daughter. He resolved that the eerie silence, the secretive townsfolk, nor the gaping sewers could dampen this flame. Arthur, a voice broke his introspection. His daughter, Ada, stood at a distance. Her gaze, so like his own, held a mixture of surprise and curiosity, and beneath it, a spark of hope. His resolve firmed. Arthur took one last look at the gaping entrance of the sewer, its echoes promising untold horrors, and turned away, for now. But the abyss, once gazed upon, leaves its mark and Arthur could feel its cold touch, as insidious as the frosty Alaskan wind creeping into his soul. Shall we, Ada? He asked, his voice carrying the undertone of determination. And with that, he stepped into the quiet town of Homer, the echoes of the abyss resonating within him, leading him towards a path draped in the veils of cosmic horrors. Underneath Homer, Alaska, where the sun's piercing glare was a distant memory, the sewers spread their ancient veins deep into the earth. Into this unfathomable abyss, Arthur Donnelly descended, leaving the comforting sounds of human life far above. 
his only companion, a flashlight whose beam struggled to penetrate the thick tar-like darkness. The air was damp, filled with the scent of mildew and something else, something older, an aroma of secrets long buried. The echo of dripping water bounced off the cracked stone walls, their faces scarred by time, whispering stories of a bygone era. The sewers were a living entity, their heartbeat the slow, inexorable erosion of stone. Along these ominous arteries, he stumbled upon strange markings, as cryptic as they were unsettling. Elaborate ancient symbols etched into the walls with what looked like a mixture of chalk and blood seemed to dance in the beam of his flashlight. They spoke of a language born from the throes of chaos, their meanings whispering madness into the minds of those who dared to decipher them. What's that? Ada asked, her voice brittle in the cavernous underbelly of the town, her presence a comforting reminder of the world he left behind. Arthur studied the symbols, the bravery in his heart clashing with the creeping sense of foreboding. I wish I knew, Ada. The truth began to paint itself in bold strokes. These were no ordinary grave robberies. The stolen bodies were pieces of a grisly puzzle, a macabre tapestry woven with the thread of an unspeakable darkness. Even as Arthur tried to navigate through the enigmatic labyrinth, an uncanny feeling trailed his steps. Anonymous letters began appearing at his residence, each containing the same cryptic symbols he discovered in the sewers. They were left unsigned, but the message was clear. He was being watched, followed, and the hunters were slowly closing in. Simultaneously, Arthur's relationship with Ada seemed to hang in the balance. Each revelation of the unholy activities taking place below Homer widened the gulf between them. I don't understand, Dad. Why can't we just leave this alone? Ada's plea was filled with genuine concern, yet tinged with a resentment he could not dismiss. Arthur felt his heart aching at her words, but his resolve did not waver. A spark of optimism still flickered within him. Ada, I promise, when this is over, he left the sentence unfinished, hoping she could fill in the rest. As the sun dipped beneath the horizon, painting the Alaskan sky in hues of purple and gold, Arthur felt the hair on his neck prickle. The shadows lengthened, each seeming to hold a promise of lurking horrors. The comfort of daylight gave way to the spectral pallor of moonlight, cloaking the town in an otherworldly glow. The evening chill was an insidious whisper against his skin, carrying tales of the dread that lurked beneath Homer. His continued descent into the town's veins was met with increased hostility from the shadows. A murmur of strange voices echoed from the dank sewer walls, a cacophony of cosmic whispers. It was a language that Arthur's mind recoiled from, its mere echo a threat to his sanity. These voices were not born of the human tongue, but were birthed from the womb of cosmic chaos, the very essence of the entities that governed the grave robberies. The revelation was an icy blade striking deep into Arthur's heart. The grotesque realization of his true adversaries was a bitter draft to swallow. These were not men he was trailing. They were ancient, cosmic entities that sought him just as relentlessly as he sought them. In the midst of his growing paranoia, his strained relationship with Ada served as a painful counterpoint. Each cryptic symbol he deciphered, each bone-chilling echo he heard, pushed him further from the tangible, the real, from his daughter. Dad, you're changing. Ada's voice wavered as she confronted Arthur. Her eyes mirrored a deep fear, a silent plea for the father she once knew. Yet behind her fear was an unspoken curiosity, an attempt to understand the darkness he was delving into. The chasm between them seemed insurmountable. I'm, I'm trying, Ada. His voice was barely a whisper. I need to see this through, for us. His determination battled his desire to reassure her, his promise hanging in the air like a ghost. His journey down the sewers took on a menacing tone as the cryptic symbols began to form a chilling pattern. They weren't merely threats or warnings, they were invitations. Invitations for Arthur to join them in their cosmic dance of chaos. The sewers' damp air grew colder, its darkness denser, the echoes of the abyss growing louder. 
Underneath the fragile facade of human life, deep within Homer's arterial veins, Arthur ventured forth. Each step echoed the drumming of his heart, a solitary rhythm within this sprawling labyrinth of despair. The stench of dread hung heavy in the air, a miasma of unspeakable horrors. His journey was no longer a descent, but a waltz with the shadows, a dance to the somber tune of cosmic whispers. The eerily captivating symbols, previously a mystery, began revealing themselves. They were a blueprint, a cosmic map through the unfathomable labyrinth, the end of which held promises of the unspeakable. These discoveries were slowly chipping away at the vestiges of Arthur's sanity. The despair of facing these cosmic horrors was a corrosive acid, burning through the facade of his optimism. Yet he pressed on, clutching onto the feeble flame of hope that still flickered within him. Ada watched him, her concern growing with each passing day. Arthur's transformation was evident. The once stoic, brave man was unraveling, his spirit eroding under the colossal weight of his pursuit. Why won't you stop, Dad? Ada's voice echoed through their once cheerful home, now shrouded in silence. Her brave front wavered, revealing the fear within. I don't want to lose you to this, this madness. Arthur looked at his daughter, his silence a painful contrast to the cosmic cacophony that swirled in his mind. Ada, he started, his voice a whisper against the storm. I, I need you to trust me. The labyrinth's haunting echoes pursued him even in the comfort of his home. A strange sensation washed over him. He was lost within the maze, yet the maze was also within him. A dreadful revelation dawned upon him. He was not merely a pawn, he was integral to the cosmic dance. The grave robbers sought him, the labyrinth was designed for him, and the horrors of the cosmos desired him. The hour was near, a preternatural calm descended upon Homer. The shadows quivered with anticipation, and the sewer's gaping maw awaited Arthur's final descent. The once mundane town had transformed into the cosmic theater of his trials. Even the snow-capped mountains looked on, silent sentinels bearing witness to the unfolding terror. Delving further into the inky depths, the labyrinth revealed its darkest secrets. The cryptic symbols on the wall converged to form an insidious constellation, a cosmic blueprint etched in blood and chalk. It mirrored an ancient ritualistic dance, a tribute to the cosmic horrors that controlled the town's underbelly. And there, at the heart of this monstrous design, was Arthur Donnelly. His every step, every deciphered symbol, every confrontation had led him to this dreadful epiphany. The echoes of the abyss roared in recognition, their voices a blend of reverence and expectation. Back in the world above, Ada paced nervously. Every tick of the clock, every distant echo of the night felt like a portent of the unspeakable. Despite her apprehensions, the stubborn spark of hope within her refused to be extinguished. Dad, she whispered into the silence, her heart echoing the sentiment. Come back to me. Down below, Arthur's sanity teetered on the brink. The labyrinth, with its grotesque revelations, threatened to shatter his spirit. His fear of heights, an ironic phobia in this bottomless abyss, twisted into a fear of the depth of his despair. Just when all seemed lost, his past trauma and the fear it instilled fueled an act of defiance. He would not bow to these cosmic entities. With a roar that rivaled the echoes of the abyss, he cast aside the heavy shroud of fear. His bravery, quiet and resolute, shone as the beacon of hope in this dark labyrinth. His relentless pursuit shifted to a desperate escape. He navigated through the dizzying maze guided by the feeble flame of hope. The cosmic horrors thrown off by his defiance attempted to realign their cosmic dance. But Arthur was no longer a mere participant. His arrival back to the surface, back to the mortal world, was as silent as his initial descent. Yet everything had changed. He emerged from the underbelly of Homer, scarred but alive, forever marked by the shadows of the cosmic entities. His survival was a testament to his will, but his escape far from complete. Ada rushed towards him, relief washing over her like the break of dawn but her joy was tinged with sorrow. The father who returned to her was not the same man who had descended. His eyes carried an abyss of their own, 
a haunting echo of the horrors beneath. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, like it and subscribe to our channel where you can find more similar stories and click on the bell icon to never miss one. There is plenty more cosmic horror to come from the Eldritch Tales factory. Stay tuned and until next time.